Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, welcome to the final AACG Fired Up program of 2023, today, December 1st. My name is Larry Sebrack. I'm the immediate past president of the AACG. And I'm filling in today for our current president, Demetra Theophanis, who unfortunately could not be here today, and she is missed. Our Fired Up program meets the first Friday of every month on Zoom and is open to the public. The other meetups which meet on Zoom on all other Fridays are, an, are for AACG members only. And our website will be listed in the chat and we encourage all nine non-AACG members to seriously consider joining the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass. Today, we have a very special program. It's our annual award symposium, which honors our annual awardee and our annual honorees. Each year, the AACG Awards Committee, chaired by Kendra Kasten, may select an organization to be honored for its contributions to the contemporary glass movement. This organization receives an unrestricted grant of $5,000. The first award was granted in 1991. I am honored and pleased to announce that this year, our awardee is the Fort Wayne Museum of Art in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And Charles Shepard, its president and CEO, will be giving their presentation. Since 2001, the AACG began a program of recognizing individuals of outstanding accomplishment in the field of contemporary art made from glass. This year, the awards committee has chosen three honorees, Bullseye Glass of Portland, Oregon, and its, owner, uh, its owners, Lonnie McGregor and Dan Schwarer, the Heller Gallery of New York and its team of Doug Heller, Katja Heller, Michael Heller, and Bob Roberts, and Duncan McClellan of the Duncan McClellan Gallery and the DMG School Project in St. Petersburg, Florida. The honorees will present a 10 to 15 minute program followed by a 20 minute program by our annual awardee. The order of the presentations will be Bullseye followed by Heller Gallery and then Duncan McClellan. And the final presentation will be by Charles Shepard of the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. This program today will run a little bit more than an hour. There will be time for questions and discussion and please use the chat for any comments or questions, which I will be monitoring. Plan to be enlightened. And let's get started with Lonnie and Dan telling us their unique story about bullseye glass. Dan and Lonnie, you want to come on? Uh, we're trying to get our PowerPoint up. And here we are. Um, first of all, thanks, um, th thanks Linda, thanks Larry, thanks everybody at AACG, and um, and uh, more than anybody, we need to thank our own thank our own community and the factory that stands behind us and has for the last fifty years. We are on the fiftieth uh, on the brink of our fiftieth anniversary, and I am going to try to cover as best I can <laughs> in less than fifteen minutes uh, fifty years of what uh, we've been about. Um, Dan and I have been here for a cumulative ninety years together. I'm tired already, but um, something that will be obvious is that in, in all that time, we, we still have an identity crisis. What are we? Are we a factory or are we a school? Uh, we make glass, but we also do a lot of teaching. Um, the first 10 years I wasn't here, uh, Dan was along with his two partners and a dog named Jake. Um, in that period of time, 1974, uh, they did a lot of things that I don't know about. I didn't arrive until 1984, and uh, it was quite amazing uh, to discover. Um, I replaced the dog, Jake, and uh, the other partner, Ray, um, had left previously, and Boyce was in the process of leaving. What exactly had been going on for those 10 years? Primarily, it was this. It was these guys figuring out a way to create a palette of glasses that were compatible for um, fusing together in a kiln, something that no glass company had ever done, as far as we know in the history of glass making, a total palette of glass. Uh, it was not as a result of any really strict um, research. Our research was 
artists. And at the beginning of the um, of the time here, uh, those artists looked a whole lot like the founders. They were old white guys. Um, quickly, we realized that maybe we should be branching out. And so we went into other media. We um, did residencies for ceramic artists, architects. The most fruitful ground for us was really um, in painting and printmakers. And in 1995, working with Narcissus Qualiata, we invited the um, uh, uh, faculty of the Pacific Northwest College of Art in to learn these methods. Some of them went on, like Christy Wyckoff, to work in the process. Uh, and most recently, and over that period of time, it's just gotten larger and larger. And, and it really has fulfilled Dan's biggest dream of being bigger. <laughs> um, and so most recently in 2020, uh, the Multnomah County Central Courthouse and this um, Church of the Resurrection that you may have um, heard about, which is a glass window the size of a foot, um, I'm sorry, a basketball, an NBA basketball field. Another way of proselytizing um, the, uh, the work that we wanted most to show was to get into school programs. Um, we've had a relationship with the Australian National University. At the time, it was the Canberra School of Art, which Klaus Moyer founded the glass program in, in 1981, I think it was. Most recently, we've done the most work with uh, the Royal College of Art in, in London. And um, uh, besides formal educational programs, we have hosted at the factory residencies, single residencies, group residencies, and classes taught both by our staff and by visiting artists. I think, you know, we've never really kept track of the number, but I did at one point look back and over a space of five years, we ran 55 residencies over five locations. And those locations were these places, resource centers. We opened Five resource centers across the United States, starting in 1995 with Portland. The most recent, um, most recently remodeled was the one in Alameda, California, which has just opened. Um, besides outreach through resource centers, we've uh, been regulars at conferences. I think, I don't know how long Dan has gone to the gas conference, but long before I was at Bullseye. And we've rarely missed a gas conference. We ran our own series of conferences until 2017. They were called Beacon. My favorite conferences are the ones in the UK because they're always really close to a bar. Uh, the International Festival of Glass has been a joy. And I understand that the Glass Art Society will be taking it over this year. Besides um, outreach through conferences, we opened a gallery in 1999, ran it for 20 years, and we focused primarily on emerging artists. So our first show was Anna Skipska. Um, and beyond emerging artists, <clears throat> well, including emerging artists, we ran a competition, which was called originally Emerge. Uh, and then we expanded to Emerge Evolve. And it, it currently runs under the moniker of TG. And it was our effort to move these exhibitions of works in this medium, Kilmform Glass, out into a museum circuit. Uh, Bellevue was the first, and we will be opening the most recent one in May of, I think it's May of 2024. Um, over the years, we've done a number of art fairs. The first we did was Sofa Chicago. We did a number of Sofa fairs. We tried um, also to um, take the glass that we were showing beyond the glass and craft fairs into other art fairs, so Art Santa Fe, Art Miami, Art San Francisco, LA Art Fair. The only fair that we still do, and it is our favorite, is Collect in London. Uh, we've done it since 2007. We'll be going back this year at the end of February. And it's there also where we showcase mostly emerging artists and a lot of artists from the, um, the Royal College of Art. In 2015, we changed the formal name of our gallery to projects to more reflect what we were doing um, in terms of not just exhibiting, but also instructing. And one of my dreams has always been children's educational programs, but until Kilmform Glass was really established on a museum level, I was always very nervous. If any of you have ever done art or crafts fairs as I did decades ago, there's nothing worse than having someone walk into your space and say, my kid does this. Um, so 
once that once we were established um getting our works into museums getting our artists works into museums we felt really fantastic to start these children's programs um uh and that's what we did and um we'll pick up again later in another part of the world uh for right now going back to the museums our relationships with museums i can't list them all but two of the most um, important ones to us in the U.S., the Portland Art Museum, where we funded um, a gallery called the Bullseye Glass Company, Contem what is it called? Contemporary Decorative, Decorative. Decorative Arts Gallery. Someone said to me, oh, that kiosk, you mean? It's <laughs> not a big gallery, but um, it also, we were proud to be able to bring the first solo exhibition at a museum of Klaus Moyer back in 2008 to the Portland Art Museum, most recently at um, Portland Art Museum, our studio um, collaborated with, again, uh, a non-glass artist, Jeffrey Gibson, indigenous artist, to create this piece uh, that was hung in conjunction with his solo show. Uh, as far as museums go, we can't have a more dear relationship than with Corning. It's where we um, donated some of the early work done with Dale Chihuly in terms of color, uh, color development and this this chandelier one of Dale's earliest was done when um, Dan saw Dale's pink pickup truck and said oh we could do that color glass and we did most recently also on site at Corning um, a commission work that was initially started by Tina Olno and then um, finished under the uh, directorship of um, of Susie Silbert uh, Spencer Finch's work in the UK, overseas, um, our favorite two museums are probably the Victoria and Albert and the National Museums of Scotland. Uh, at the Victoria and Albert, um, we've been really fortunate to work with the curator there. We've stalked him for years. Um, you can see his great horror after our years of of um, <laughs> the collect show and showing him the incredible work that Carlin Sutherland does with our materials and these methods. Um, this is their most recent installation in the contemporary uh, glass department. Uh, I've also stalked curators in Scotland. Um, Sarah Rothwell, who is um, senior curator of, de um, of design at the, New at the National Museum of Scotland, is responsible for collaborating with us on a project um, that has brought into, most recently, uh, an Anna Pater's piece into the museum there. And that is the result of this. Um, we may be having an identity crisis but we often, um, we've taken it right to the edge. And that is where this work uh, is showing. Um, we, a few years ago, um, opened an, uh, an exhibition space at the 58th Air Parallel of the northernmost county of mainland Britain. It is in, in 18th century barns, stone barns called a buyer. Uh, this includes a pig sty. You can see the Anna Pater's work in the distance. We do this show about every two years, and the National Museum of Scotland's curator selects a work from that piece to bring into the museum collection, which is to add to the remarkable collection that Dan Klein and Alan Poole left to that museum um, in 2009. Artists also come with us to the edge, to the 58th parallel, uh, to do the work, to reflect on the space, and to continue this mission that we feel. And the mission is, I guess at this point, after 90 years together um, and 45, uh, uh, 50 years at Bullseye, occasionally the most common, the most common question we get asked is, uh, Dan, Lonnie, <laughs> uh, what's going to happen after, uh, you know, after I, we croak? Yeah. Um, what's going to happen is this, it's going to continue. We have started a foundation, a trust, um, to continue the works that, uh, that we've been doing that oftentimes, um, underscore our identity crisis. Um, but they are based on this sense that glass is a transformative material and that this edge on the sheets of the hand rolled sheets of glass made here at our little factory, 
that edge that shows what happens as a material transforms from a liquid into a solid. Um, and in this particular logo also mimics the coastline of the place where we are doing this final work. And it is a continuation of what happens at the factory. It is a mission to continue the um, uh, promotion and the awareness of this material in these methods. Uh, it is a collaboration between a factory, a community. This community is just a tiny view of some of the workers at the factory. It's much larger than that. And this final last slide is something that we just purchased yesterday. Yeah. Um, it is a mission hall on a tiny village in the northernmost county where we will continue to have residencies, work with children, work in the community, and continue to spread um, our, our fervor for kiln-formed glass and for these methods and the artists that work in it. And thank you. There you go. Thank, thank you, Lonnie and Dan, for sharing um, the evolution of Bullseye and your dedication and continued dedication. I didn't realize it was your 50th anniversary or coming up to your 50th anniversary. So our next speaker, who's our second awardee, the Hellers, it's their actually actually their 50th anniversary of their gallery. And um, Katja and Doug, you want to um, uh, take it from here. All right. Well, first, uh, let us thank the organization for this recognition and say what a pleasure it is to see so many familiar faces on the screen. And uh, Lani, you did an exemplary job, which will be difficult to follow. But I think it's appropriate that we follow Bullseye because so much of our fate has been intertwined. We show artists whose glass has come from Bullseye. At least on hey, guys, just left you a voicemail. <laughs> you can't hear it? No, that's uh, Aaron oh. speaking. Okay. <laughs> well, some of some of the same artists uh, that they have exhibited in their gallery, uh, we have exhibited. Uh, just to quickly give you the origin story of the uh, gallery, because that's so often asked. In the early 1970s, I had a very dear friend, Joshua Rosenblatt. His parents were great dealers in antique glass. Minna Rosenblatt Antiques was one of the preeminent uh, antique dealers that reintroduced Tiffany and then Art Nouveau glass. And uh, at that point, my interest had been in pre-Columbian art, with much to the horror of the Rosenblatts, who thought uh, and that sort of indigenous work was, uh, quote, hideous. So Mr. Rosenblatt, particularly Sidney, took it on himself to teach me about beauty. And they started to uh, show me what made interesting work uh, and why and how it represented more than just decoration, how it intertwined with uh, the cultural milieu of the day. And then eventually, uh, when Josh and I were doing nothing, uh, Mrs. Rosenblatt said, I have a good idea that'll keep you boys busy. And she said, you know, we've been approached by a number of uh, young contemporary glassmakers and uh, we would like you to consider representing them. That was a light bulb moment for us. And then uh, we started to research the field and ultimately came up with four names uh, of artists that we would represent. That was Mark Pizer, uh, James Lundberg, Roland Young, who was teaching at the Philadelphia College of Art. And the fourth one eludes me at the moment, but... Uh, Katja has been showing some illustrations here, images of our different galleries. Over the years, we've occupied seven sequential spaces in Manhattan. In the very beginning, Josh and I began by uh, doing shows and we did the antique shows with the feeling that this was the audience that would understand what they were seeing and uh, be potentially the audience for contemporary glass. And in fact, we used, operated under the rubric of the uh, antiques of tomorrow. But our official name was the Contemporary Art Glass Group and Gallery, with a feeling that that title explained what we were having, whereas having a, a Heller Rosenblatt name would be basically meaningless to most people. So we started up on Madison Avenue, 
in the early 1970s in a very tiny space. The uh, image on the screen right now, though, was uh, the uh, gallery in Soho. Uh, this so, the tiny space? No, this is not the tiny space. This was our third location. The tiny space was uh, at Madison Avenue and 68th Street, which was a very prominent, a, what you call a carriage trade neighborhood. It was an incremental move to the third space because that was on 67th Street. Right. So we first had the, the tiny space, this illustration here uh, with the greenhouse, that was our second space, just one block south. And at uh, 450 feet with the downstairs, it was six times larger than the original space. This is our space at Madison Avenue on 76th Street up near the Whitney Museum. This was the downstairs space in, in that uh, location. So we kept moving quickly. This uh, illustrates the Vanini show that we had in Soho. Soho, I believe, was our fifth space and uh, a very dramatic step both in change of neighborhood because Soho at that point was totally an artist's neighborhood, mostly uh, people living in lofts. It was so quiet in the beginning of our years there that you could take a chair, put it in the middle of the street and sit down and read a magazine. But uh, that quickly transformed. I'm going to quickly go back because I think I made somehow uh, these these two uh, Aaron these two Aaron slides the, here. These two are examples of one of the exhibitions that we did outside the space. This was a classic cast iron building, working with Chris Freeman, a neon artist. We got the permission of the landlord, much to the horror of the other tenants in the building to do a series of exhibitions on the full facade of the building. We did three of them. These illustrate two of them. And it, first of all, it was remarkable that he was so open-minded and uh, it was just something that was unprecedented, even in Soho. This is our Bertil Valin exhibition, one of many that we had over the years. This uh, Bertil had envisioned a forest of trees as, a forest of heads, as he called it, because that recounted this legend of this girl that fell asleep for, I think, 40 years. And when she eventually woke up, the only thing she remembered was a sea of heads. And Bertillo wanted to replicate that concept. And this, uh, this was a major step for us, the Soho Gallery, because of the size. Uptown, uh, would, they were all small Back spaces. To the Soho Gallery. Right. This is the interior view again of the Vanini show. By the way, this was the last exhibition that the uh, Vanini family had before they lost control of the company. And uh, it was a remarkable one. It occupied 3,000 square feet with uh, chandeliers. In the rear of the gallery, we had a collection put together by Leonard Tompkins who was a Canadian dealer, and uh, he had all kinds of examples of antique Vanini pieces. So it was really an excellent, excellent overview of what the company had been, but what a shame it was the last undertaking that the company had. Here, um, you're seeing one of our numerous Lebensky Brechtova exhibitions in the Soho space. And we began to work with the Czech artists in 1980. This piece is a piece that we coordinated uh, with a group of donors, uh, including the Weisses, Gerald Kafeshian, uh, and, George and George Russell, who no, Katja had been working with, who was the founder of the uh, Museum of Glass in Tacoma. This piece uh, is one of two that went through us and ended up in the Metropolitan Museum of Art permanent collection. One of the interesting conditions that we put on our gifting the piece and along with the other generous donors was that it would not go into the decorative arts collection and that went into their contemporary art collection. One of our early missions in the first 10 years was to get the doors open in museums that had been resistant to even considering anything in contemporary glass. And we had success pieces uh, from Tom Patty, uh, went into the Museum of Modern Art, into the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is a piece that went to the Met called Banded Flare, just an exquisite example of his blown laminated work. Uh, and we got work into the Cooper Hewitt, of course, the American Craft Museum, and then a, a, the Corning Museum of Glass as well. This is the facade of 
our meatpacking space. After Soho, we moved on to the meatpacking district. Our moves were predicated on several things. One was uh, rising in the untenable rents that in New York City can be remarkably intimidating. And then the other one was a search for space so we could properly be the platform that would reflect the evolution of what was going on in the field as it worked from small objects into much more conceptual pieces. This was a form of meatpacking plant that uh, the owners of the building had purchased uh, when it was derelict and rebuilt the entire interior. Uh, our good friend Hale Gerlin made the steel sign and you can see it's bent uh, out of shape, which it would be every couple of months as big trucks delivering things would smash into it. So it was this endless- The joys of doing business in New York. Yes, the give and take with the reality. This is a, an installation of Lino's uh, in our space in the meatpacking district. It op occupied a full room and was just extraordinary. Uh, a moment comes to mind when Christina Bothwell was visiting with her children, one of whom became a gymnast, and she decided to take a running slide under the piece. It was uh, very impactful on me for sure. You know, uh, This had, I believe, 30 different elements in it. I believe 18 of them uh, ended up in the Corning Museum of Glass. And when you visit and see the inst Endeavor installation there, that was selections from this piece. And uh, the rest of it actually went to its in uh, number seven World Trade Center in the private uh, boardroom of uh, Mr. Silverstein, who was a big supporter, particularly of Lino Tagli Pietro, but the arts in general. This was another exhibition in the meatpacking space. This was one of Ginny Ruffner's most fascinating one. It had tens upon tens of thousands of dried roses on the floors, suspended sculptures that you can see, just a, a remarkable thing. And the entire piece was ro rose colored. So we were always trying to push beyond just the object and, and to really reflect the innovations that the field had seen develop over the years. This is a Tom Patty installation there. Tom developed, you can see the framed uh, patterned piece. That's uh, something he calls art guard. He would laminate layers of glass together with films between them. So they were both works of art and very durable and functional uh, pieces of glass that could be put inside buildings. They were literally bulletproof. Uh, one of the artists that we helped launch a career for was Karen Lamont. This is a piece that uh, went to the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia. This was Beth's, Beth Littman's banquet, banquet table, mm -hmm. banquet chair. And uh, this, this is a piece that obviously wasn't going into too many private homes, but we managed to get it toured through a whole series of museums. And I, I still recall one time it was at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma. If you look closely, you'll see under the table, there are some broken objects. It had to do with loss and the possibility of loss, the piece, not only opulence. And some of them were broken and on the floor. And I was standing in the lobby where the piece was on display and a little boy was pulling on his grandfather's arm going, grandpa, grandpa, I didn't do that. So, it elicited responses from people of all ages. It now resides in the permanent collection of the Smithsonian. This was a, a bridal tower. We had two of them flanking uh, the doorway in her exhibition in the meatpacking district. So you can see that the large spaces allowed us to do things where artists could really stretch creatively. Uh, this was, who was Hiromi this? Hiromi Takazawa. Oh, yes, Hiromi's piece, Crossing the Pacific Ocean. It was an autobiographical one with the neon on the roof. And on the uh, bottom, there were all these bowls that reflected the glass airplane, but going in the opposite direction. And she felt that this was a, an apt symbol of her personal journey. Another artist we introduced to the United States, uh, the British artist, Luke Jerram. This is also in the meatpacking plant. Many people know Luke's works from uh, his works with viruses. Uh, and uh, the chandeliers uh, had these rotation devices that respond to the heat of light and uh, just fascinating pieces. And move on. Oh, 
Okay, Mark Riegelman, this was all about recycling, breaking the bottle installation. He recreated his living room of the home he grew up in. And all of this was from uh, fragments of broken glass bottles. This is one of Mark's outdoor installations. He does a lot of work around the country for museums on commission basis doing- This was in Louisville, mm -hmm. Kentucky. And those barrels were symbolic of the uh, the trade there in the, in the spirit world, spirit world being uh, alcohols. Uh, Kim Hardy, uh, who we are going to be having a, another exhibition for coming up soon. Uh, it'll be part of our winter series. This is Kim's piece. Yeah, I, we, I, I put this slide in here because I just wanted to say that even though we don't have a making facility, obviously, we are just a gallery, um, unlike Lonnie and Dan. Um, we, we have worked with many uh, studios here in New York. This was Brooklyn Glass, where Kim did this performance, where I, the tutu on the right was actually a, a dancer who was supposed to be a dust ball or like a tutu ball. And she was uh, rolling around. And so um, while Kim was pouring the piece that eventually ended here in our um, exhibition. And um, when we opened the exhibition, we um, hired the dancer and she uh, came and was the tutu ball at the opening also. Uh, we, we've we engaged in some uh, pretty, uh, not non-profit, not not for profit, as Doug says, and non-profitable, non-profitable ventures in in doing this. Um, Nor with Viviano, uh, the first edition of his city's departure and deviation. This is in a meatpacking district, and uh, this piece ultimately was displayed at the Smithsonian and acquired permanently by the Corning Museum. No, my, of Glass. this one was by sorry Houston. This Houston. is in Houston. My mistake, and we're. This one is in Corning. This one is in Corning presently. And uh, we're very proud to say that not only did we help open doors in the beginning, not just car doors, but uh, we helped open uh, museum doors. And to this day, 15 to 20 percent of our business is actually with museum institutions. Right. But we also uh, like to involve ourselves very much with nonprofits. Katja is currently chair of the board of Urban Glass. Uh, I had been there for many years. I think between the two of us, we had served on the board for 45 years. Uh, this is when we were moving out of the meatpacking district and that uh, fellow pushing the box or attempting to get the box in the van. That was Pete Waldman, our packer at the time. Now, this is the beginning of our exploration of our newest location. That's Seth Scantland, not the best angle, I'd say, but uh, that is Seth up there on the ladder. Now we are located uh, in the Chelsea Arts District. We've been here for 10 years. This is uh, 20, 7th and 28th Street on 10th Avenue. You can see to the right of Seth, there's a reflection of the Empire State Building. Uh, this is Amber Cowan's, one of Amber's exhibitions, although you can see a piece there by Josefa Gash Mucha to the right, and then to the right on the floor is one of Ivana Shramkova's pieces. This was, this was actually, the reason I put this slide in is because this was our opening day in this space where we are today. Um, it was a snowstorm day um, on December 14th, but we decided we were gonna open anyway since we said we were gonna do that. And I think uh, very few people came, but I will say that the Fishers came from Long Island. They That was the furthest anybody drove in from, and um, it was quite the trek. We um, did have people in the gallery, although many of them were homeless people seeking uh, shelter from the storm. That's a reality. Um, and I just, um, so I, I'm going to just quickly try to finish up here. I want to first, first I want to join everybody in saying thank you to the ACG for the honor. Um, thank you for to everybody who has supported us um, over the 50 years that we have been in business. Like Lonnie, I have not been here for 50 years. Um, I, uh, I joined the gallery in 2000 um, and really uh, have appreciated dealing with all of our clients. Many of you are on this call. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and should I say maybe mostly, I, I love working with the artists. I 
As many of you know, I came from communist Czechoslovakia. My uh, motto has been that I have a um, disposition for the opposition. And I think working with glass and people who work with glass has always reminded me of what living in a kind of a counterculture is like. So um, this exhibition, one of uh, the ones that we, uh, we, we have in our program, we have uh, focused, as, as Doug said from the beginning on um, artists who have worked with glass. Many of them are your typical object maker, sculpture object, design pieces, whatever you want to call them. But very often we have tried to also give space um, and voice uh, to artists who want to maybe reach beyond that in, uh, in any way that they would like. In 2015, we featured this exhibition by Kathy, um, Catherine Gray, um, now of the blown away fame, um, but um, then this was many years before that, um, where she wanted to recreate the feelings of being in a hot shop. And this was a part of that. One of the pieces that she made for this was a series of uh, scents. I wouldn't necessarily call them perfumes. Um, they were in the following um, scents that are described here, paper, sleeve, wax, and block. Um, some of them were not perfumes you would wanna wear, but um, they were certainly reminiscent of the hot shop. Um, and these snifters were part of that exhibition. We also worked with Kathy um, on the opening exhibition at Urban Glass, uh, which was a which was a, a similar thing to uh, the trees that she has in Corning. Um, Sibylla, Sibylla Peretti. Peretti. This piece is uh, residing in the Barry Museum of Art, I believe. This is our current show for Josefa Gashmucha. And I'm sorry, I know we're running out of time. So we'll just flash through, through a few Nor additional Viviano, slides. Um, in a variety of um, aspects, this is Vladimira Klampar. Again, I just want to say that we were working with Vladimira not because many of her sculptures, while they're very beautiful, abstract, and um, but in that way, they're also somewhat enigmatic. I loved the fact that Vladimira is an avid and sensational gardener, if you don't know that about her. And she always referred to the, her gardens as a portable sense of home. That's how she describes them. And so I, when she proposed an exhibition, I said, how about if we do something with the idea of the garden? And this was that. Uh, we have worked with Amber Cowan, as uh, Doug said, this is um, this is the early um, this is the this is the early um, this is you saw the earlier work and this is these are current pieces of embers. This piece right now is in an exhibition of hers at uh, Millville in New Jersey. Um, and speaking about kind of heading towards the future, um, here are some people whose work we feel is in that category: uh, Pam Sabroso and Allison Siegel who bring kind of that idea of uh, spontaneity and sort of um, enthusiasm and exuberance uh, to with, but with much more expanded skills to kind of that feeling of the early glassmakers uh, work by Deborah Cheresco, um, Matt Sauce, um, bringing back Kim Hardy to remind everybody that we are going to have a Kim, show of Kim's. And I really think that Kim's work with um, this particular body of work with the old Venetian glass, which combines performance, glass history, and photography is really amongst the most undervalued and amazingly interesting work, in my opinion, um, in the field. Um, Carlin Sutherland's work. Erica Rosenfeld, um, Anthony, Anthony Amoko Atta, um, who you also saw, uh, like Carolyn, in Lonnie and Dan slides or images. Um, this is the, one of our more recent shows, which we had with um, Noam Dover and Michal Siederbaum, Israeli um, Swedish artists uh, who explore the idea of amphora as the first man made container and its influence on. Um, expanding trade and trade routes and international exchange in the world. Um, poignantly, of course, they are, the studio is in Israel uh, where uh, some of this work was made. And um, 
I am ending with this. Two Levinsky pieces currently on view in the gallery, a fabulous screen, which was one of the developmental works for their great window in the uh, St. Vitus Cathedral. A couple of years ago, Katya and I were interviewed by an art publication, an online platform. And one of the questions was, well, what do you think your greatest achievements have been? Well, my answer to that was paying the rent for 50 years. But moving from a, a greatest achievement to a most meaningful, I would say it's been helping artists realize their dreams and bringing it to the world. So thank you very much for your patience. I know we ran a little bit over time, but 50 years in 24 minutes, not as good as Lani, but we tried. No, no problem. And certainly uh, you've you've discussed your the dreams that you've uh, made um, possible. Um, it was a great trip down memory lane. I really like the meatpacking gallery a lot. Um, and I like going down there. Um, so I just want to tell Duncan and Charles, don't worry, this was not, this is not limited to an hour. You've got plenty of time. I'm sure that most of the participants in this Zoom are going to stay on. They'll want to discuss things. And by the way, Doug and uh, Katja, happy 50th anniversary. Thank, Thank you. you. Duncan, are you ready? I guess so. Thank you, Larry. Um, and uh, we really want to thank all of the AACG and all our supporters uh, in light of uh, the present awardees and the past ones. We are so honored to be included. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, Larry and Linda asked me to put together uh, kind of a, a history of uh, where we've been uh, as a gallery and uh, an educational complex, uh, as well as uh, what we're doing presently and where we plan to go in the future. So we're very honored by this and thank you very much for being here today. Um, it all started uh, about 69 years ago. Um, we, uh, 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 pardon me, um, I would like to also thank all of our present colleagues and past colleagues for making this happen, especially my dear wife, Irene, uh, who has been with me this whole time during this adventure. Uh, it started back when I grew up in Orlando. Uh, I come from a family of artists. And uh, my father announced uh, to my brothers and sisters, he wanted us to go to the World's Fair and especially to see the Pieta. And I'm sure there's some people here that uh, remember seeing that. Well, my dad's idea of going somewhere and coming back was just a direct uh, visit and get back into the car and head home. So he piled us all into the Valiant. And then, uh, but my mom won out and we stopped at the Blanco Glass Factory, which uh, was an incredible experience for me. Uh, I was about seven at the time. And I hid from my parents uh, for about three hours so I could always go back to the glass blowers. It uh, was uh, something, a memory that I'll always have. And I, I truly think that we're a combination of all our experiences that brought me here. Uh, I wanted to be a farmer. Uh, I wanted to be a restaurateur. Um, I wanted to be an artist, which I became. Um, but I also worked for a circus, which kind of set me up for being a gallerist. Um, it's often that way around here. Um, my work uh, in glass, I was able to uh, take a small lesson in Ybor City uh, here in Florida, as there were no really uh, schools or furnaces at that time. And uh, I was able to go find the New York Experimental on Mulberry Street. And that's where I got my initial training, but I was able to meet Chuck Books, 
uh, a friend of mine that built a studio in St. Petersburg. And I worked out of that for the last 20, or 20 years. Here's some examples of my work. My new work is very different. Um, I moved, I uh, was doing exhibitions all over the country, uh, uh, fairs, uh, art fairs, I would do gallery exhibitions, um, but I didn't want to continue to travel. After about 20 years, I had enough. And I wanted to find a place that was welcoming to art that seemed to understand the power of art and how art can change a community. This is a building I found in St. Petersburg that was an old tomato packing plant. Uh, it was pretty rough. Um, in fact, about two months before I bought the building, uh, they were making crack on the back of it. Uh, it is not that way now from uh, the few people that have visited in the last few years can attest. Here's some uh, images from the first uh, beginnings, and then it took us about a year and a half to uh, rehab the building. This will give you an idea of what the present place looks like. The Duncan McClellan Gallery. Located in St. Petersburg, Florida's thriving warehouse arts district. More than a gallery, the DMG complex is 13,000 square feet of inspirational ambiance, offering the largest glass art gallery in Florida. Showcasing the innovative work of more than 50 national and internationally renowned artists. A tropical oasis featuring private courtyards a beautiful water feature, and glass sculptures throughout. DMG is also proud to feature the largest advanced hot glass workshop and teaching facility in the region, providing creative hot glass demonstrations and classes for private events. Here's uh, examples of uh, some of the exhibitions that we've had over the years. You'll recognize uh, many of the artists. Our sculpture garden, uh, Eric and I planted every tree and bush in our garden. Uh, we have over 70 tropic, uh, varieties of tropical fruit trees. And I figured if the glass gallery didn't work out, I could at least sell fruit. The Warehouse Arts District is one of six districts or uh, creative districts in St. Petersburg. Um, the previous mayor uh, came over when I first uh, opened to take a tour, and he mentioned to me um, uh, that I had to help form the Warehouse Arts District. And I asked him, what is that and why do I have to do it? And he said, oh, it'll just take, uh, I can tell you in 15 minutes, and uh, it'll only take you a year. Well, most politicians don't tell the truth, and he's one of them. It took a lot longer than that. The vision for the Warehouse Arts District is a place where artists can move to, to live, work, and show their work. The city has made variances to allow for that, which has been very helpful. We've identified over 250 artists that live in about a mile square area and more and more artists are moving in. And it's really exciting to see how all of this has happened. Uh, we have the Morian Center for Clay, which has over 80 clay artists working. Uh, we have Zen Glass Studio and Gallery. We also have uh, the Imagine and the Chihuly collection here. We're home uh, to one of the largest collections of murals in the country. In fact, each year there's a festival creating new ones. The DMG School Project is our educational 501c3, which is really kind of the force behind the whole place. Uh, I believe in education. It's somewhat of an outgrowth of what I've always done, uh, working with other artists, uh, encouraging, mentoring, 
as well as working with students to have them understand uh, some of the principles of working in class. We have outreach programs uh, partnering with inner city schools. It's a three lesson uh, program where uh, the first two lessons are completed in the school from information that we download. Um, uh, and uh, they uh, culminates in a coming over to the gallery for a tour, to the hot shop for a demonstration, and then to uh, etch their uh, final product of what they are uh, they worked on in their school. Uh, the importance of being able to work with students and getting them to understand the uh, aspects of glass isn't just for glass itself. It's actually for uh, teaching them that what they're learning in school is so vitally important for anything else they choose to do. The amazing thing about glass is when it catches on fire and blows up, you get the kid's attention. We also do outreach programs that are mobile. We raise funds uh, for a truck and a trailer. Uh, this was one of the ads that we used. And this is our sandblasting unit that goes to schools. And this is the hot glass mobile unit that teaches over 300 children in a day. And again, we're not focusing so much on the glass as we are focusing on the science, the history, uh, the math, uh, of what it takes uh, to study glass. We're trying to get that aha moment. We also do master classes for people that have never done glass before. So they have a whole weekend of uh, being immersed in learning and creating some beautiful pieces. Here's John Brecky, who I met at the New York Experimental, teaching a Graal class. We, uh, one of the other functions that we do, and I think some of uh, uh, the other people have uh, borne this out, that it's Im important that artists get a, a chance to work in a studio and to be unfettered. Uh, so we provide emerging artists, uh, opportunities to come in for several months in some cases. Uh, we offer them a show. We do their photography. Uh, we uh, mentor them in how to make a living in glass. And it's also for uh, mid-career and professional artists to be able to have a studio and the concentrated time. This is one of our uh, artists, uh, Aya Oki who happens to be Catherine Gray's assistant. Hello, my name is Aya Oki. I'm an emerging artist in residence at Duncan McLellan Glass Studio in September. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. DMG residency gave me a very special experience. In my time at this residency, I was able to focus on and define my current art series. This is thanks to the wonderful team and the mentors that supported me throughout my time here. We do free public demonstrations and lectures because it's really Im important that the public gets a true understanding. I remember doing some of my first shows and trying to explain the process of glass, and I'd lose my voice halfway through uh, uh, the show. Um, and now the public can get a much better understanding by seeing it being done, uh, as well as being able to talk to the artists and find out what their reasoning behind making their work and how they do it. You'll recognize quite a few of these artists. Now, Larry also asked, well, what are we going to do next? I don't know. I know we'll constantly evolve. 
Uh, we're still very, very excited about bringing new artists into the fold, as well as supporting uh, established artists. So perhaps we'll be the first hot glass art zip line in the world. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Duncan. Thank you. And thanks for giving that overview and your commitment as an artist, as a, as a dealer, and as, as a community, as a major force in the community of St. Petersburg. Uh, thank you very much. Now we'll turn this over to Charles, who's the 2023 um, awardee uh, representing the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. And um, we've gone from the gallery uh, to the hot shop and let's, the goal is to get much of this work recognized in the museum world. Charles, tell us about the museum. Charles. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Larry. We and thank you to everyone who's attending today. I appreciate your commitment to this program and, and to AACG. Thank you, AACG, for this wonderful award. Uh, we all feel deeply honored to receive this. So, so again, thank you. Uh, I want to talk about three basic things today, and we'll share a screen in a minute and show some slides, not a slide presentation, but some slides for you to, to look at some beautiful things that show what's coming into the museum. Recently, what came in uh, maybe about seven years ago now, this beautiful Martin Blank. Uh, but I wanna talk about our history first because that, that really pertains to Larry's uh, question of the issue of getting glass in museums. We like many museums, just didn't have glass in our past. Uh, we're 102 years old now. There are so many institutions in that same age range. And the reason glass didn't figure into those institutions in our institution initially is, is because of the way most museums without big budgets collect. And that's by donations from regional and local collectors. And those collectors tend to buy traditional things, paintings, prints, bronzes, a few small marbles. And so as a fledgling museum starts to grow, and that is the kind of thing they collect, and they begin to feel good about that because those are quote unquote museum type art objects, uh, where is the curator for thinking about glass? Where is a budget for thinking about glass? And I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone here because I spent most of my career building university museums before I got to Fort Wayne. And I included sculpture frequently, but I never looked to glass. And when I got here, I actually didn't look to glass until I went to the Denos Art Museum in Traverse City, Michigan. And there was a Howard Ben Trey show now, I was naive enough, and forgive me for this, I didn't know who Howard Ben Trey was or that he worked in glass, but I, I heard it was wonderful sculpture, so I went to the show with my wife, Amanda, who also worked at the museum, and we were blown away by that show and a, a little baffled by how glass could be that big. And the architectural nature of Howard's work uh, just defied our imagination. We, we inquired and we found out that the show had been curated by Ferd Hampson of Habitat Gallery. And immediately on Monday morning, I called from the house in Traverse City to ask for Ferd and to tell him how stunned I was by the show and tell him how, how embarrassed I was. I, I didn't really understand what I was looking at. And Ferd, thankfully, being very patient and of good humor, uh, took me sort of under his wing and said, you know, I, let me show you more about this glass and get you interested. And he did indeed, it was contagious. And I, I realized that I'd missed glass as a medium in sculpture entirely in my art historical training, as do most curators who go through traditional art historical programs. But I realized it could be remedied. That could be remedied. And let's start immediately 
I said to Ferd, how can I have a glass show? How can I have a wonderful glass show? And Ferd said, well, why don't you come jury the international show in the spring? And then after we have it here, take the winners for the international show. And that was something in the range of the 40th uh, and exhibit them at the museum. And we did. And we also borrowed from the Columbus uh, Botanical Society. We borrowed some chihuahuas that they used in their gardens that weren't in use presently. And we pulled together a whole curatorial feast called the Summer of Glass. And it never would have happened without Ferd and Habitat and the Columbus Botanical people. And the reception from our audience was astounding. More people came that summer than any previous summer in my years here. And at the front desk, we asked, why, why are you here? Uh, well, we're here for glass. We're here for glass. We heard you had glass. And yes, they knew the name Chihuly, but they truly loved all the different winners uh, that showed up in the international as well. Caitlin, if we have another slide, let's take a look. This is something very new for us. I'll speak to this in a minute. This is a new installation of Paul Stankard's work uh, that we acquired with the help of a local donor, had a special mirrored case made so you could see them full round uh, and purchased them uh, from Habitat Gallery, actually. Uh, so our past was naive. Our past was, let's go get some glass and let's, see if it's a great fun thing to do for people, which it was. But I say it was naive because we, we didn't have a plan, really. We we thought, let's every year have a summer of glass. And, you know, that sort of was the extent of the commitment for the first couple of years. What I began to realize as I met many of you uh, at different events and many of the artists is that we really, I'll tell you, we were paying short shrift to glass. <clears throat> glass needed to be fully part of the museum's collection. And even though we didn't have a lot of money for collections, uh, we needed to find some. And we needed to find some people that were willing to get in there and support us with this. And then we need to tell them what we're going to do. So what were we going to do? We're going to, we're going to study glass. Everybody in the curatorial staff is going to have to learn all about glass. We're going to have to watch every video we can, read every book we can. We have to be intelligent about glass. And, and we have to realize that if we don't bring glass to light in a fine art museum for the public, it's sort of going to be re remaining in glass museums or in small ways in larger museums or in private hands. And we felt a very strong commitment to our community and to the glass community that we should take a leadership role here. We should develop the means to get a collection together, by the way, which is now more than 600 pieces and growing by about 100 pieces a year. We have to have an intelligence that informs that. And that would be, let's look at 1963 with Harvey, and let's come into the present and let's go into the future. I had, at that time, I had no idea how much glass that might be, but that's the, the logic that I thought that would be respectable for a museum to attend to the study of it. So the pieces that aren't as exciting from the early 60s and early 70s to the pieces that got more and more exciting as everybody learned more techniques and, and they got to more training programs for people and, and more interrelated work in different people's studios. So we would have a mission. I can say happily that the board was on board immediately with the notion of us making glass the most major part of our collection, which yes, includes bronzes and marbles and prints and paintings, but the number one feature of the Fort Wayne Museum of Art would be glass. And for the first three years that we were intellectually following down that path, I would check back every meeting of the fall, first meeting of the year, 
Are you still with me? Do you still believe in this? And they did. And I thank my board for that support. And also the community helped them have a strong backbone for this because the community spoke by visiting more frequently and always would say, I would say probably 85%, 90% of people coming in would say, we, we need to see the newest glass. Now, presently, we got so excited a year or so ago, we opened a glass wing. So our glass collection would always be on display, except for the fact it's too large now to all be on display. So we rotate our glass collection in the wing in three different galleries. We also feature other glass shows throughout the year. Uh, as a matter of fact, tomorrow morning, we'll open a Habitat International show again. Uh, we've been working on that for days. It's gorgeous. Uh, and it allows me to sneak another gallery away from some other media and devote it to glass. We have people lined up online to attend that opening. I think that's going to be exciting. Uh, and we had to expand our storage, obviously. Already, we've had to make storage space uh, for up to 1,100 additional pieces. And I'm happy to say that's half full right now. So we're expanding yet another storage wing for that within the building. Now, where is this going to lead? I think in a couple of different areas for us. In terms of space, I think we'll put on a 20,000 square foot addition for exhibitions. I think we are soon to buy a separate building for art storage so that we can expand in an existing building that we can convert which would be less expensive than adding on to the 20,000 square feet, another 15,000 square feet for storage. Uh, I think we need to start writing and publishing uh, about glass because I don't think the art history programs are awake to it yet. And I think we need to get them awakened. I think we need to help young historians who write text for art history basic classes like Art History 101, 102, which many of you may have had, they need to include some passages about what's happening in the glass movement. We're thoroughly committed to that the sculpture in glass, and Caitlin, you can throw another slide anytime you want. Um, the, the sculpture in glass is more exciting than any other sculpture that's being done these days. We have a beautiful de Suvero out out in front of the building, and it's a gorgeous piece, but it's when de Suvero figured that you might be able to make sculpture out of industrial steel that would be more interesting than anything else that was being done in the in the late 60s. Well, I think he was right, but but we never moved on from that. And glass moved on. Glass moved on to some of the most interesting forms and its malleability, its ability to work with light, which the other sculptural forms don't have. And its ability to be worked on in so many different ways are just head over heels in a better situation than any other medium in my estimation. In terms of the public, wearing just my director of a museum's hat, the public has responded better to what we're doing in glass than anything we've ever done. It doesn't seem to abate in any manner. Uh, if we have a goal, and I don't want to sound too bold here, but our intention is to be the center for contemporary art made in glass in the entire Midwest. Currently, we have the largest collection in Indiana in contemporary glass. I'm always teasing the people in Toledo that we're going to beat you soon, not in historical, but in contemporary. And I see taking three more years and having, they call Fort Wayne the crossroads of America. People will be coming to the crossroads, not for conferences, not, not for rallies, but to come out to see the glass. I wanna thank you for the time that you've given me today. Oh, Larry asked me a couple of questions quickly I wanna answer. 
Younger public, do we attract a younger public for glass? Yes, we do. But to tell you the truth, there's, there's no age limit here. But I will tell you the school children that we work with 30,000 a year love the glass. And we even have a school glass collection that can go on the road to the schools with our education people, as well as bringing the schools uh, who have buses in. And how about the fine art visitor? How does a fine art visitor at least in our region, react to having glass. Honestly, they find it the most exciting fine art they've seen, and they tell us that all the time. I, I'm so proud to be doing this. Uh, it's the number one thing I personally work on every week, and I'm I'm proud to be here with you folks today. And let me letting me speak has been a blessing. Thank you. Charles, thank you very much. Um, your excitement is contagious. And um, I, I want to thank you for that presentation. And I want to thank you for all you're doing in Fort Wayne. And I'm sure that it'll go way beyond Fort Wayne. When you were in Traverse City, I hope you were there during the Cherry Festival. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, great. So... <clears throat> We, we, we only lost about um, eight people in this uh, in, in the of our participants. So going a little beyond was not a problem at all. And um, there are not there are not any specific questions in chat. And I think that um, I think that the best thing to do might be to open this up for discussion Um and I think, uh, Linda, maybe we should turn off the recording and um, we can have an open discussion with everybody. Uh, how does that sound to you, Linda? Sounds good. I'll do that. 